rule applies as last night if we happen to miss one or uh, you've got uh, a question that we didn't get a chance to answer, please uh, save that for tomorrow. We can try to answer that for you tomorrow. So, okay, let's take this, this first question and uh, not had a lot of opportunity here to sort of review these before. So some of these are, are a little bit longer than others. Uh, the first question is this, it sounded as if you thought it sounded as if you thought circumstances could or would not influence or impress upon a person a predisposition towards homosexuality even before they become physically mature. Are you sure? We are sure men are responsible for their own sin, but as it is written, a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. This, I think this may have been a question uh, with respect to the session that I did uh, this afternoon. Uh, so maybe I can take a stab at that and then open this up to uh, Mike and Rick here. Um, yeah, the, the, what the, the, the latest APA announcement um, addressed that they believe there were, there's a complex mixture of both nature and nurture that is the cause for homosexuality. And so I'm trying to remember to hold my mic right, guys, sorry. Um, so a combination of nature and nurture. Basically that means environment and upbringing. And that it is a, a combination of both environment and upbringing that cause homosexual behaviors or lend themselves to that. And we wouldn't disagree with that. Uh, ultimately the cause for homosexualities or depraved nature is sin. Um, but giving outlet to sin or taking advantage of our sinful natures would be of a horrible sinful upbringing if you've got a, I know looking at the statistics uh, those children that were children of homosexual couples were I want to say seven times more likely to be 70 percent more likely to be homosexual themselves so we know that environment we know that upbringing nature and nurture both contribute to the the lifestyle the behavior um, but ultimately that responsibility falls on our sinful nature our depraved nature I hope that makes sense uh, the, the last statement there, um, referring to what some call a, a generational curse, is visiting the iniquity of the fathers uh, to the third and fourth generation. Um, when scripture talks about that, the scripture is very clear that each person pays for their own sin. Um, the fathers are culpable for their sin and they're guilty. They'll pay and they are responsible for their own sin, the Bible says. The son's responsible for their own sins. And so there's not a... A generational curse in the sense that you know this father sinned and so now for three or four generations each of his sons are gonna pay spiritually eternally for the sins of that father doesn't work that way however we all see don't we how the effects or the consequences of sin can affect sons and daughters to the third and fourth generation and that's certainly true of this particular kind of lifestyle and these particular kinds of sins that um, because of the way that you live if you um, abandon God you throw out the word of God from your household and you teach your kids to blaspheme God in the same way uh, the the effects of that sinfulness the effects of that neglect the effects of that blasphemous lifestyle going to affect your family for generations. Um, I hope that answers the question. Anything to add to that, Mike, Rick? Okay. All right. Next question. Can you explain again the response a Christian has when they fall into a sexual sin? How can they, um, how can they again be assured of the sal their salvation? So how can you again uh, explain the response a Christian has when they fall into sexual sin and how can they again be assured of their salvation? Got a passage in mind, brother? You want to go first, brother? Yeah, I'll start. And, um, yeah, I talked about that briefly last night. There's the objective truth of the gospel. Have you repented and believed the pure gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? That's the objective test. And then there's the subjective test that we find really given in 1 John. There are a lot of characteristics that describe what a born-again Christian looks like. You know, oftentimes I use the illustration that when we have a child born into our family, they pretty much don't look like their parents, but as they grow and mature, they begin looking and taking on resemblance of one of their parents or both. And it's the same way when we're first born again of the Spirit, 
we probably look nothing like Christ, but as we mature and grow in the grace and knowledge of him and conform ourselves to his likeness, then we begin looking like the characteristics that are found in the epistle of 1 John. And so we've talked about how Christians will struggle with sin. I think the difference between struggling with sin and living in the habitual sin is the real issue here. If a person is in habitual sin and has no desire to come out of it, then I would question whether or not they're truly converted. But if they desire, if there's a, dis a struggle against this sin, then they need to call on the Lord Jesus Christ who has saved them from the power of sin. And I think an accountability system is important. You need to have people praying for you, uh, coming alongside you, protecting you from continuing in that sin. But there has to be that desire. If there's no desire to depart from the habit habitual sin, then I would question the person's conversion. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, does the present-day Catholic Church believe that homosexuality is a sin? If so, what do they do with all the pedophilia in the priesthood? Well, they, they give lip service to the fact that it's a sin. But once again, when you look at the Roman Catholic hierarchy, they have three authorities. The Bible is one, but they also have the infallible teaching of the bishops and then the sacred tradition that has evolved over 1,600 years. They say all three are equal in authority, but in actual practice, it's the bishops that sit above scripture and tradition, and they do a lot of twisting and distorting scripture so that it harmonizes with their ungodly traditions. And so now we have this pope, who many believe is infallible, as Catholics do, but he is saying things that not only go against the Bible, but also go against historic Roman Catholicism. And so Catholics right now are questioning who to believe. It's a great opportunity to witness to them and show them the only authority that you can really trust is the Word of God. And since the Bible calls it a sin, that's what we must believe. And it doesn't really matter what anyone else says whether it be a religious institution or a man who's all over the map and his philosophy and whatever he says. You saw the picture of him on the Advocate magazine. I mean, if he's not calling it a sin, homosexuals would not be embracing him as the spiritual leader of the LBGT community. And so he may wink at it as sin, but he is saying that homosexuals have a place in the church and they can use their gifts to build up the church itself. And so officially in the catechism, it's a sin, but in practice, I think they wink at it. All right, next question is, uh, Pastor Mark mentioned a few organizations infiltrating the school system. How do we counsel, protect, and prep our children facing the, these attacks every day? How should we rally within schools, maybe Christian-based support? Uh, yeah, we talked about that, I spoke about that in that, that session um, this afternoon. Uh, I would say that understanding that you don't want to abandon the education of your children to the school system. Uh, if you send them to public school, you homeschool them. If you have a homeschool umbrella, you send them to a private school, religious school, any number of schools. Uh, you don't want to abandon the education of your children to that school. You as the parent are responsible for their education. Uh, and being responsible for their education, that needs to be a biblical education. You need to be teaching them from the word of God. And so you want to be talking about these things. And so that would require then, regardless of the circumstance, whether they're homeschooled, they go to public school, they go to a homeschool umbrella or a Christian school, that just requires that you as the parent to be very, very, very active in their education. And so what's going to happen during the day, during the week? Or when are they going to be addressing subjects like evolution? Or when are they going to be addressing subjects like sex education? Or I mean, those, all those kinds of things. Homosexuality is going to come up. It's, uh, it's infiltrated, woven into the fabric of the curriculum and many, um, the, many subjects that are out there. And so ask the question. Uh, if your kids are in public school, 
Go to the principal, stay in touch with their teacher, email back and forth, find out what they're going to be covering and when. And if it's a subject that you would rather uh, have influence over your child for and you don't want them to be exposed to whatever's going to be taught that day in school, write to the principal, call the principal, and get permission to take them out of school that day. I know in our area, that's still a viable thing that you can do. If you contact the school, you can say, listen, I don't want my son or daughter to be exposed to that, and so I'm going to bring them home on that day. Uh, you can let them know. Um, just be very, very active. Um, be up there on a regular basis. Stay in constant communication with the teachers. And then, too, if you're teaching your kids from the Bible, then you're talking about these things on a regular basis because you know there are going to be issues. And so uh, I think it'd be great to teach your kids uh, creation and to talk about that frequently so that when evolution comes up in the classroom, it's a an object lesson, a teaching opportunity. You might not pull them out of school that day, but it becomes an opportunity to let them hear, so you can see, son, see what we talked about, and see how the world believes, and here's what the Bible teaches. Just gives you opportunity to work with them. Uh, same thing with homosexuality. They're going to be faced with it, and they're going to be faced with it at a very early age. Uh, and so good to talk to, be talking to them, teaching them from the Bible, and preparing them for that time. But I just think we have to be, in order to rally support in order to protect our children, we have to be the ones teaching them and we have to teach them from the Bible um, and to teach them to stand. I love the, the slide I love that um, Mike had put up earlier that we've got to be able to stand alone. Your kids need to learn to stand alone. Uh, they need to be able to be independent enough to be in the school and alone in their beliefs to say, you know, to take a stand for what the Bible teaches against what everybody else says or thinks or does. They've got to learn to be able to do those things. The only way they're going to learn that is from their parents being taught from the Word of God. Anything further with that? Um, as far as rallying support, um, I, you know, there's not a lot of room for Christian based organizations in the school system. As I think the best way that you can rally support is to get to know the teachers, get to know the administrators, and um, find those that empathize with your point of view and communicate with them and stay in touch with them. Um, the other alternative is to bring them home. Or I know there are several uh, homeschool umbrellas. You can now get a public as far as I'm aware, the, the moms I'm sure in the room would know far better than I would, a public education through Florida Virtual School at home, but you're taking the, the public school courses uh, online at home through Florida Virtual School, that's an, an option to you as well. Many, many options. I think I would highly recommend just talk, talking to a bunch of the um, moms and dads in our church that are doing various things. We've got uh, moms and dads that have kids in public school kids in homeschool, kids in Christian schools, kids doing it online through Florida Virtual School. I mean, I think pretty much our church is full of folks utilizing various options and just talk and find out what's going to be best for you and your family. All right, let's take the next one here. The next one is, I've been hearing new terms besides homosexual, bisexual, and transgender, and it's very confusing. People are coming out as pansexual, polysexual, asexual, among other things. What do those terms mean, and why are people finding it so important to label themselves like this? Um, um, sinful men will continue to invent evil things. They'll try to distort the uh, gender that God has ascribed to them by birth. So don't, um, don't let that confuse you. Don't let that discourage you. Uh, just understand as, 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 as best as you can what the Bible says. And if you know what the Bible says, you can address that error. You can inform your family and those you love. And if you're in a situation where you are able to preach the gospel to these, uh, to these people, you'll know where to go and what to say. Okay. Um, the next question is this. It was mentioned in a hinting way that Adam might have been engaged in bestiality. Oh, well, I'm not done with the question. Oh, yet, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
I was just looking at you like, yeah, I remember when you said that, brother. <laughs> is, <laughs> is it possible when Eve had not been made yet, nor tempted when the sin came into the world, would God allow such an abomination? From my study of the word, I see nothing that indicates such a... I'm not sure what the, forgive me for not being able to read that, but I think you get the gist of the question. Uh, there's no indication anywhere in the Bible that Adam committed bestiality. So, and, and I don't um, believe, if, may, I apologize if something like that, but yeah, I don't, there's no indication. And all that was obviously too, when he's naming the animals pre-fall, so yeah, hope that answers your question. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions, um, one of the questions when we're hired for a job is about diversity. As a Christian, how should I accept, quote unquote, a gay person knowing that only God can change the heart? It's a tricky situation with being hired and the question of diversity. Mike, you want to take that? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm certain that, well, I, I work in a secular setting and um, there are men that I work with that struggle with a slew of sins. Uh, they're not Christians. They don't profess to be Christians. They have difficulties in different spheres of their life. And I work with them just as the same way that I would work with somebody who's a homosexual. Um, God calls me to provide for my family and to be a witness while I'm at work. So I work really hard. Um, my diligence in work gives testimony to the reality of my Christian faith. And if the Lord opens the opportunity, maybe during lunch or outside of um, work hours, I do share the gospel with the people that I work with. But um, it's, um, I don't want to shy away from the fact that the Bible does uh, categorize homosexuality as a very, very debased and low um, and wicked sin. But nonetheless, um, all other sins are offenses to God. So the men who, who lie and say crude jokes and all of those things, those things offend the Lord also. So um, it's sort of just a gospel witness. Work really hard. When the Lord opens a door, you know, don't, don't steal on the clock. Don't, don't. When the Lord opens the door, be faithful. And your witness and work will, will, will really help you in those situations. And I would just add one thing. I think a lot of it depends on the relationship. If it's your boss that's a homosexual, then that's a different kind of a problem. But if it's a peer, someone that's equal to you, or maybe your subordinate in the business, then that gives you more freedom. But I think a rule of thumb is if the gay person um, confronts you in their gayness, then you have every right to respond as a Christian with your biblical beliefs. Because when it comes down to um, the boss over both of you challenging you, you can say, well, they're the ones that brought up their lifestyle and I was just countering with my lifestyle. And so then the other opportunity, I think you said it well, is just be a light and look for opportunities with your peer so that the gospel can go forth. But if the boss above says you cannot share this on company time, you have to honor that and maybe invite the person out for coffee after hours or whatever. But if there is interest, then you can go as far as they will allow you. But I think being an example of Christ likeness really goes a long way. People want to know about the joy that you have in your life and maybe they'll be asking questions of you. Yeah, um, me and three other members of this church uh, all worked for the same company at the same time, and our supervisor's boss was, um, was a homosexual. And because of our conduct and our work, I know that the four of us had the opportunity to share the gospel with her multiple times. So we never got in trouble, and... Um, we were employee of the year several times, uh, each, each of us. Uh, they, they love our work ethic, and we never had any issues with those things. It's just a matter of your Christian witness. Great testimony. 
I work full time here at the church, and I'm trying to share the gospel with folks. I'm trying, you know, looking looking for opportunities. We'll feel pray about that. See, we'll see what happens. <laughs> okay, uh, many people in the LGBT community are committing suicide because they aren't accepted into society and things like that. And people are placing blame on Christians. How do we respond to that? Could you repeat the first part? Yes, sir. Yeah, many people in the LGBT community are committing suicide because they aren't accepted into society, things like that, and people are placing the blame for that on Christians. Well, that's misplaced blame Amen. because, you know, if you're living in habitual sin, living apart from God and rebellion towards him, there's no joy, there's no peace, and so ultimately I think that's a life of despair and people have no hope. And so it's unfortunate that they would rather commit suicide than searching for the hope that can only be found in Christ Jesus. But to put the blame on intolerant Christians, remember, we reflect the intolerancy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to stand firm in love and approach them whenever we can and share the only hope that they have. Yeah, very good. Um, thought about it that uh, you know, we have laws already established that are there to protect anyone who's bashed about anything, you know, or anyone who's, uh, we have laws already in place that protect uh, workplace rights. So yeah, it's a good way of putting it, misplaced blame. Um, statistically, homosexuals make more than heterosexuals. They're afforded more options than, homose than heterosexuals. So yeah, it's just a misplacing of blame. Thank you, brother. Um, the next question is, uh, is the media intentionally failing to report the crimes homosexuals commit against children and the violence in their relationships? You think it's intentional on the part of the media? I don't have an answer for that question. I don't work with the media, so I wouldn't, I don't know how to answer that. I don't have the data. There is a lot of unexplained things going on in the world today. And the only thing I can think of, it's demonic delusion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you think that we now have a Muslim in the White House, a Muslim who hates Christians and hates Jews, and yet we reelected him. Why? I mean, we know of highly intellectual people that have good jobs that voted for this man a second term. And so I, I just got to believe it's demonic delusion, just as the prince of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. I think he's blinding people from the truth of reality as well. I mean, there's no other explanation. And so I just throw up my hands and say, it must be demonic. Yeah, miraculous blindness. Um, there's certainly a bias we see. We can, we can visibly see the bias. And um, so much uh, in the liberal media, the liberal political party, <laughs> those kinds of things. Um, yeah, miraculous blindness. Um, the next question, I recognize that we are all born with a sin nature and have fallen short of the glory of God. I have a family member I've attempted witnessing to, and he and his friend tell me they were born this way. My question for you is, do you believe in a generational curses? And if so, do you believe they can be broken? And we've pretty much addressed that. Um, yeah, not in any as far as the generational curse, but I think we explain how sin, uh, the consequences of sin uh, continue. And so hopefully that question is already answered for you. Can I have a question? Um, you said, uh, I recognize we all are born. Uh, I have a family member I've attempted to witness to, and he and his friend tell me they were born this way. Um, can someone uh, be drawn to uh, that particular sin from a very young age? Yes. Yeah, they can be. Um, so it, there's a good possibility that these um, men or women, whoever they are, um, have been struggling with this particular sin from a very young age. But it's still a sin. It's still a sin. And they can find forgiveness, and they can find the power to overcome their sinful inclinations if they would believe 
in the Lord Jesus Christ if they would turn from their sins. So I think Pastor Mark addressed the issue of biology very, very well in his talk. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's the advice that I would offer. Next question. Do men have one less rib than women? So I, I Googled that, and we have the same number of ribs. But, but remember, I, well, you, you don't have to. When God gave me my wife, he didn't take a rib out of my side. And I'm pretty sure that didn't happen with you either. No? You've, you've got, yeah? So, it's only something that happened with Adam. I don't know. But we do have Adam's apples. That's right. That's what we do have Adam's apples. Okay. All right. Um, how can you quickly but effectively discuss someone's homosexual lifestyle uh, from the word in a work or school place, like during lunch break, et cetera, when time is short? I think you just mentioned that. Anything further we want to add to that? Okay. Next question. Uh, what advice uh, would you give to parents who, despite teaching their children the law of the Lord, have children who are practicing homosexuality? What advice to parents? Pray. Pray fervently. Um, uh, share that struggle, that difficulty that you're going to with other uh, faithful um, Christian men and women so they might pray and uh, be faithful to um, be salt and light. Don't allow that sin to, if you have other children, to influence those other children. Make it very clear that it's a sin. This is wicked. Just, um, I have young boys and uh, they, they, you know, they're constantly going at each other or doing different, and it, I call them out on their sin appropriately and they're disciplined for their sin appropriately. So as a parent, if you're still the legal guardian and, and it's, you know, not a 25-year-old woman or a man, um, uh, apply the right amount of biblical, godly, good discipline to the child, pray, share the word of God with them, have others pray for them, and um, uh, protect the other children in the home if there are any. And Mark, I think it goes back to what you shared earlier. If parents really love their children, they will not affirm their homosexuality. To affirm their homosexuality is not to love them. And so I think um, sharing what you just shared is so important. And we also realize how easily influenced children are by the culture. And so as a parent, are you watching what they watch on TV? Are you guarding them against the culture, the Hollywood pervasiveness of this sinful lifestyle? And if they are open to all of these things coming into their home, maybe it's a good time to cut that off and to watch more closely what's influencing them. Yeah, come back soon. We're going to have a conference in May on that very issue, children and technology and just the, the media influence on our kids. Uh, that is going to be a very important uh, time. So uh, last question. We've got to get you home and let you guys get some rest. Uh, to Mike specifically, uh, when preaching the gospel to a sodomite, can we preach the cross and the resurrection without preaching repentance and faith? And so repentance, I guess, is repentance only a response or also a command by God for men everywhere to repent? Is the nature of preaching the gospel and repentance. Yeah, when we preach the gospel, it must include repentance and faith as the only saving response for salvation. You cannot leave that out, otherwise you've given an incomplete gospel. Remember, there are so many people who have head knowledge about Jesus being a historical figure that lived and died on a cross 2,000 years ago, but that head knowledge doesn't save them. Faith in Christ, as he is revealed in the Bible, must be coupled with repentance, a turning away from sin, a change of mind about the way you once lived and believed you could be saved to trusting Christ alone and nothing else.
for your salvation. Yeah, thank you, brother. Uh, if I could add to that briefly, uh, if you were here for the introduction of our brother on Friday night uh, and the introduction of the conference, I just mentioned the story about Korean airlines that went off track at the beginning of the flight when the flight took off and how over a period of time it was 60 miles off and then 120 miles off and then before it crashed, 300 miles off. Um, and let me encourage you, if you're visiting with us or here from another church, um, if you're not in a church that faithfully preaches repentance and a turning from sin, preaches against sin and preaches a biblical repentance which involves turning away from sin, and you're in a church that to some degree or another has departed the biblical gospel and is now off track and is heading in a direction that is gonna affect so many different areas, heading in a direction that is gonna be spiritually destructive to your soul, it's gonna impact teaching on other things, get out of that church. You cannot toy, you cannot mess with, you cannot alter even one mite the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and think that it's not gonna have influence in people's spiritual lives, it's not gonna have influence in the church. Uh, in fact, if you're gonna betray the gospel of our Lord that way, you forfeit the right to call yourself a church. And so for the churches that preach an ask Jesus into your heart gospel, right? Admit, believe, and confess, and there's no repentance. Get out of those churches for, the, for your own spiritual health and vitality, for your own good, and get to a church that accurately and faithfully preaches the gospel. It is the most important thing. So you've got to be faithful to those things. But thank you, brother, for preaching that. And, all right, well, let's um, pray and get you guys home. We'll pray, and then I've got just a couple of requests of you, and then we'll depart for the day. So, brother, would you mind closing us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we uh, are so thankful for the opportunity and the privilege to study this uh, vital topic that is affecting our nation, our communities, and the church at large. And we pray that uh, the truth that you have graciously been revealing to us um, uh, throughout our time together, that, that we would apply it, Lord, that we would believe it and that we would share it with others as you give us opportunity. Lord, I pray that you would bring us back here tomorrow. Thank you for my brothers and for all of their labor. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.